Yes, I think we'll pay it a visit. Right, first things first. I could go to the fisherman's shacks. I think that's where the other trap is located. There's a couple things that can't open, not sure about the container. It's okay, we'll find out. Um, let's go to the fisherman shacks. Because I would like to finish some missions before we wrap up the night. That's locked. Can't see the house from this angle, okay. Yeah, so long as you are at one of the predetermined fast travel locations, you can fast travel. I know. I was trying to do it outside of where, uh, outside of one of these locations, was not working. But uh, yeah, you can fast travel. Right, if it's locked, can we... Oh, wow, that's a massive tool. Thing's huge. Okay, we have these nice people we can speak to. We have our drunk friends. Maybe it's a new feature. It might be, actually. Uh, who's, Whose jacket was this again? Hold on. Uh, Idiot Doom's jacket. Is that you? Or I'm really unobservant. He's back. <laughs> and firstly, I got smoked. Right, don't need you. Tequila. There we go. Sunset. Found your jacket. Ah, oh, tequila. I knew you'd come through. That's fucking great, man. I found a little more than I bargained for. <laughs> it is covered in shit. What's that supposed to mean? Uh, there was a dead body nearby. I mean, that's true. What's that got to do with my jacket? I mean, nothing, probably. Although it is a weird coincidence. What do I care about some local stiff? Are you going to give me the jacket or no? Go for it. Let me see. What? This isn't my jacket. My jacket was beautiful. This is fucking filthy. What am I supposed to do with this? Look, I may have just seen an omen of my impending death. I don't care about the jacket. <laughs> what do you expect? You left it outside for a week. Um. Yeah, I found it like this. I'm not taking a disgusting pile of hobo rags. I may be in an irrecoverably decaying orbit, but I've still got standards. Either bring it back the way it was before, or find a dumpster to burn it in. Well, he's delightful. You know, despite the guano, it looks like the jacket itself is stain resistant. It may just need a good scrubbing. Hmm. Okay. So apparently we can wash the thing. What's, what's this? Oh, it's a bench, right. Guano! <laughs> okay, where did he say the trap was? Uh, dead body traps. Uh, near the canal you crossed. Right, so it's going to be this way. Also, there's a shack I never went into. Let's go to check out the shack. Actually, I might have been in the shack. I can't remember. I've been in the shack. How are we doing on time? Okay, it's not too late yet. And that trap should be around here somewhere. There it is. Beautiful. This trap's not too hard to spot. Once you know what to look for, keeping it hidden has not been a 
priority for the cryptozoologist. Okay, look around. The reeds bend forlornly toward the sand. You see slabs of concrete north. In the east, the city center hums to you. Excellent. The constant distance song. Louder on this part of the coast. Nearer somehow. And there's that cold again. Always the cold. Okay, check the trap. Nothing but locusts in this trap as well. Definitely no cryptozoological monstrosity. That's a shame. Empty as all of them. One more of these and we're done. His face is red from the cold sea air. He crouches to catch his breath. Uh, I must stress that I did not expect the cryptozoologist monstrosity to be in this trap. Are you getting tired? No, no, I'm fine. I didn't mean to complain, it's just... He short-winded the sentence ends there. That's fair, honestly. Right. So we've checked the trap. Don't need my car. Can I... I still haven't talked to these people because it's been that kind of playthrough so far. But um, from here, I should be able to travel back to the church, I think. Or I can go to Martinez. Okay, we're going to go to the church. Then we're going to go to Martinez. And we're going to report back on the traps. While we're picking up the uh, the piece that we need. It's all part of my plan. I like to pretend that I have plans. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see... There's a time limit of like six days or something. You're super unlikely to hit that time. Okay. I didn't know there was a time limit, to be honest, so. Oh, this is the fisherman sack. Um, I didn't think I would run into that directly. Where? Oh, it's over here. Okay. Yeah, apparently there's a time limit. Yeah. And the last trap. This is the last of the traps. The one Morel just set. Checking it over, he said, is just a technicality. Look around. The reeds by the abandoned campsite hiss and shake. Uh, there's no time limits for certain quests, but not generally for the game. Oh, okay. Oh. The later it gets the colder. Remnants of the camp can still be seen in the sand. The fire that's gone out. You feel strange. Certain events take place after Somehow. a certain time. Okay. Right, reach for the trap. The trap feels light and silent as you pick it up. Something is different here. Ooh. Uh, last time events occurred on day five. Okay. No locusts. No locusts? No phasmid either, but still. Look closer. Well, the bait worked on something. This doesn't mean it was a reed monster, though. Unless you see one in there, I just see an empty trap. Uh, seems like they do expect you to finish the game four to six days. Fair enough, based on how much content there is. I mean, that's understandable. I mean, it's not like there's a whole lot to go on here, but that's okay. We're on day three. I mean, I, I figure we're about halfway through the game. Uh, what if it was the Phasmid? What if it ate them and got out? Um. It probably wasn't, but morale needs to know. We did sort of promise to tell them, didn't we? He seems to regret the fact. Also, we were obsessed with this reed earlier. And I'm still covered in stink juice, which is just hilarious. But that's okay, right. They have these kids to talk to, gotta do that at some point. Although I remember people said that they have the world's largest conversation, so probably avoid that for now. Right, take me to Martinez. And first things first, gonna report on the numbers. Inside, 
you see a set of steering levers, a radio microphone, a pull-out toolbox, and the soft glow of the fuel preheating. This is precinct 57. How may I assist you? Uh, let's see. Right, heard back about the serial numbers. Yes. The armor was produced by Fairweather in their facilities in Betancourt, sur la clé in 42. Excellent. It was part of a special order for Corps de Pharmacie, a security firm contracted to protect the interests of Iranian pharmaceutical companies. Ah. The Seminine conflict. So it's possible he was working for the lady. Okay. So, it seems the armor went to Seminine. That's where the paper trail ends, though. Even the firm has proven difficult to track. Corps de Pharmacie has been renamed several times over in the years since the armor was issued. Fair enough. Uh, do we know what it's called now? The most recently registered firm that the ICP has been able to connect to the CDP is a military contractor called Trinel. And the one before it was down when. I think they might be the same contractor. Okay. Brian? A suit of armor like this would have been manufactured with a particular person's physique in mind. You should ask for whom this suit was fitted. Okay. Uh, first the... The bit of bit of bit of first the firm continued to work for pharmaceutical companies through all the name changes. Um, yeah, let's go with that first then. How to say the client list is rather diverse and incomplete. The only concern seems to be that the mercenaries are always deployed in third and fourth world countries. Okay, and the suit of armor would have been customized. Yes, but the ICP tends to be reluctant to share private sector records. I could try to talk them into it though. Okay. This is a fun challenge for her. An opportunity to contribute beyond doing her job by rote. She'll gladly put in the extra effort for Team RCM. Okay. Yes, thank you. I appreciate your efforts on the case. Glad to help. Call back tomorrow. Hopefully I'll have more for you then. Okay. Uh, I can contact Sylvie again. I don't think I need to. Um... Need to report the dead body on the sidewalk. Sidewalk. Boardwalk. One moment. You can hear her shuffling through papers. Can you please describe the body? Age, sex, cause of death? Unidentified middle-aged man, height 170, 175, dark hair, medium build. Looks like he slipped, fell through a hole in the boardwalk, and hit his head against the metal bench. We suspect he might have been inebriated when he fell. There were bottles all around him, and traces of vomit on his shirt. Any signs of violence? No, seems like an accident. No field autopsy necessary. Okay. What about his belongings? Did you examine his clothes? He's wearing boots, trousers, and an old leather jacket the, with a bright blue lining. I find a library card in his pocket. Any information on the library card? Central Dram Dram Dramrock Public Library belongs to someone named Billy Mejon. Good. You have a lead. Do you and Luton Kitsuragi want to take the case, or should I assign it to someone else? We are taking it. I have assigned the case to Lieutenant King Kitsuragi. Please follow up on this library lead to identify the man. We'll send someone to take the body to the morgue. Excellent. That's all for now. Thank you for reporting in. Is there anything else I can do for you? Uh, do, 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 do. Connect me to the 41st. I don't think I need to bug them. Jamrock Public Library. Hold on, officer. I've got Central Jamrock Public Library on the line, and I've already introduced you to their librarian. Connecting the call in two, one. Yes, this is Central Jamrock Public Library here. How can I help you, officer? Excellent. A male librarian answers the call. He sounds worried, yet ready to assist. This is how people get when the police call. I mean, that's true. It's how I talk to the cops. Uh, I'm looking for any information that you can provide Millie Mejon, a reader. That's assuming I do talk to the cops, though, because, yeah. Billy. Billy Mejon, you said. Give me a moment. I'll have to check our database. He puts down the receiver. On Moreau Drive in Central Ow. Jamrock, in a darkened <laughs> hall lit by orange desk lamps far away from the noise outside, a middle-aged man taps commands into an old radio computer. A printout falls on the desk. Behind him, a lonely reader scours some dusty bookshelves, looking for a paperback. Okay. Yes, hello. Are you still there? I found Billy Majon's home address. Is that all right? No phone number, unfortunately. Excellent. They're too poor to have a phone line. 
Yes, home address is fine. Here we go, sir. Rue de saint Gislain, 33B, apartment number 20. It's in Martinez, I believe. Cape Side Apartments, it says. That's all. Excellent. Uh, any other info? It says here that they returned their last book just a few days ago, but I wasn't at work that day. Anybody who was? Shivers interjecting with its weirdness is great. I agree. Shivers is fantastic. <laughs> John, they returned a Tybalt book the other day. You hear someone answer from afar. Yes, it, it was my colleague Marie. Uh, she said that it was Billy's husband who returned the book. He also asked for this new sci-fi release, Lowe's Radio City 87. But we don't have it yet. Excellent. Okay. Good. You have a name now. Uh, how did your colleague know it was her husband? Do you know the husband's name? Sorry, no. Marie only knows him by sight. Okay. But how do you know it's the husband? Marie knows Billy. She's been working here longer than me. Sometimes her husband returns some books for her. Okay. And then goes for a little drink later. On the lookout. Excellent. Can Marie describe to me what the husband looked like? Marie! A moment passes. She said it was an older man, and that she's pretty sure he'd had a drink or two the last time she saw him. <laughs> what was he wearing? Uh, one second. Librarian turns away from the phone again and relays the question. Sorry, Marie wasn't really paying any attention to that? Yeah, fair enough. Uh, thank you, that's all for me, no other questions. Happy we could help. Goodbye, officer. Librarian hangs up and the call gets redirected back to the station. Anything else you need from me? Um, no. 57, over and out. In the cabin. You see a set of stick. Don't need anything there. Excellent. And... Right, we still need to pressure him. Ooh. Hold on, what was your check? Make way for the master poet. Uh... Right, the lady what? driver. But I told you she's my friend. Please don't make me give her up, detective. Get someone else. There's a ton of drivers here. Hmm. Thank you, friend. The homophobe might be able to tell us more. We'll investigate that. Uh, freezer. Okay. Get out the massive tool. This orange machine is buzzing like an old submarine. It has a hand-cranked ice cream churner on top and an electric freezer that appears to be frozen shut. Apparently this is, um, this is not what's going to work well. Um, physical instrument. Hmm. Interesting. Um, right, we know it's not actually in the bear fridge. Screw it. This orange machine is buzzing like ice squeaks Damn. beneath your Kvalzun multi-tool. But your fingers slip away from the tool. The lid shut as tightly as before. Hmm. Unplugging the ice cream maker will allow it to defrost. This check is bullshit. I succeeded on 3% with the normal pry bar, but it told me to come back later, and I had to do the check again and failed. Wow. Okay, so apparently we have to defrost it, Only even the though... the cable is plugged into the breaker box, while the red one lies neglected on the floor. It literally tells you not to unplug the ice cream maker and make it make the item cold or make the item warm um, in one of the things that you're reading about the that particular thing so let's try increasing physical instrument that's fine give it a shot this orange machine is buzzing like an old submarine can I get anything better than this Get a negative. 
Unfortunately, no positives. Okay. Well. This orange machine is buzzing like an old submarine. It has a hand-cranked ice cream churner on top and an electric freezer that appears to be frozen shut. Oh, do I actually have an item? Hold on. I mean, I know it's not any of these. Um, unless... Uh, electrochemistry. Oh! Thank you, Hippophant. <laughs> I thought I had something. Right. Best chance I have. This orange machine is buzzing like an old submarine. It has a hand cr ice squeaks beneath your Kvalzun multi tool, but your fingers slip away from the tool. The lid shut as tightly as before. Where's Verpix now? <laughs> Unplugging the ice cream maker will allow it to defrost. Hmm. I don't like that we have to unplug it. I really don't. Because it literally says not to. I feel like bringing her a broken thing would not help things. Um, the black cable is plugged into the breaker box, while hmm. the red one lies neglected on the floor. Can anybody tell me if defrosting it makes it a worse outcome. Because I want to know. It doesn't? Okay. Only the black cable is plugged into the something close to you. Dies with a soft electric purr. Very smart. Opening the lid should be much easier after the ice cream maker has defrosted. There we go. Okay, so that's sorted out. Uh, might as well change my shirt back. Yeah, that's fine. And head upstairs. For one thing, I think my dice are ready. For another thing, uh, <laughs> I kind of want to investigate what else she had on her computer. Right, flashlight. Hold on. There we go. Which dice did I get? I don't remember. But we'll find out in a moment. Tiles on the cube are still smoldering, casting the framework in a soft glow. Okay, the press play. Good afternoon. Dr. Please repeat. Password. Please repeat the password. Afterlife, death. Good. I've unlocked the production schedule. After ending the call, please press print to access the filament. Excellent. Maybe she just used the same password? Maybe those radio computer guys aren't that paranoid after all. <laughs> accident. That's all. Thank you, and goodbye. Tiles on the cube are still Okay, press print. With a quiet determination, the printer starts printing. A piece of paper unfolding like a handheld fan. A black crisscross of letters covers its surface. Uh, read the printout. It's a project report written by the lead producer, Andrew Andy Schott, about Wirral Untethered, a radio game developed by Studio Fortress Accident. The first few pages give an overview of the capital and workforce, while the rest of it seems to be a production schedule. Okay. Um. Yeah, okay, read about the capital. In its short time of existence, Fortress Accident SCA managed to burn through truly insane amounts of money. Interesting. The first tranche of seed financing brought in 150,000 Ria, but then came the delays. Good God. Eventually, the damage reached 400,000 Ria, with only half of the game finished. Where did they get all the cash? Let's just say it was a real adventure for their Egaunian investor. Awesome. Uh, right, the workforce. Fortress Accident employed 18 people. The bulk of the team composed of writers and concept artists. There were also radio programmers, sound engineers, a CEO, 
two marketing experts. Sounds like they filtered all the money into their pockets. And a single overburdened producer who developed a habit of popping Corolidon in the basement to escape his obligations. Excellent. Why did Fortress Accident have so many concept artists? Yeah, why does a radio game need so many artists? It didn't. It didn't need so many concept artists? No, definitely not. A few more producers could have come in handy though, especially when dealing with writers, some of whom routinely skip to work because of mental health issues and extremely unprofessional sleep schedules. Speaking as a writer, I do have an extremely unprofessional sleep schedule, so that's fair. Also mental health issues. I mean, spot on. <laughs> One of them even managed to steal some valuable company property before skipping town for good. Okay, but I don't steal, so that's fine. Um, <laughs> skin through the production schedule. The production schedule depicts the glorious descent into bankruptcy. Because of the concept artists? Not the concept artists. It wasn't even the writers, with their panic attacks and three-hour lunches. It was impossible not to fail. The project was too large, and no amount of money could satiate the ever-expanding ambitions of the development team. Ah. They tried to make a four million real game with 400,000 in their bank account. Gotcha. They thought they could bridge the gap with pure willpower and imagination. They couldn't. Gotcha. I could have bridged the gap. <laughs> uh, no, they were done in by their own ambition. That's fine. No, even then, success remained within an ever narrowing margin of possibility that, despite everything, never entirely disappeared. Really? That is, until they discovered the Valley of the Heads. Oh. The what? At the 11th hour, the lead designer, Jims Bourne, Suliswav Jalisa decided that what Wural Untethered needed was a secret mystical location at the extreme edge of the map. Okay. This place was to be the Valley of the Heads, where the heads of all the headless constructs could be found. The player would have been able to choose a head for their headless party member, and each head would have been voiced on air by a professional actor. Wow. Um, that's insane. The world had never seen their kind before, and might never again. How many were there? So many. The last count, there were approximately 10,000 heads for 10,000 headless men, all of which could be endlessly recombined. How many combinations is that? Do you really want to know? There seems to be a calculation here, but it may take a while. Uh, how bad could it be? Oh! Okay, so there's, it's it's a few. It's 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 definitely a few. So that's the number of combinations. And and no no it's definitely a few. <laughs> Keep going. Oh good God. <laughs> okay, that's um. That, that's a that's a big old number. Let's see where this goes. Yeah. The lieutenant taps his foot impatiently, <laughs> his arms folded tight against his chest. Uh, continue. <laughs> oh, good God! Big number hours. Yeah. So it's it's not like a Google or anything, but it's damned if it's not trying. Oh wow, brain. What if you broke the radio computer? What if it's never going to stop? Just let the numbers wash over you, man. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, we've hit zeros. And that's it. Beautiful. <laughs> I really hope that that is the actual calculation. And honestly, looking at it, it very well could be. Okay, so that's what did them in. Well, yeah, that and the catastrophic data loss. Right, and that's the anomaly Suna mentioned. It's the attention to detail. It is! 
On the nature of the data loss, there's ominously little information in the production log. It comes at the very end where things get fuzzy and dark, where tables and numbers seem to vanish into an eerie nothingness before the Egalnian investors pulled the plug. Okay. What is clear is that one day an unidentified numeric anomaly occurred on the East Insulindian Lintel front, just as the Wirral Untethered project was being compiled that day. Hmm. That's way better than a Google. I can't remember how big a Google is. Oh yeah, 10 is only 10 to the 100. I'm thinking Googleplex, which is Google to the Google. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking Googleplex, which is bigger than we have space for in the known universe, last I checked. It's a, it's a number to the power of Google. <laughs> but. Uh, right, the anomaly caused all data to get lost in the air. When the project was returned, it was completely blank. Okay. The team spent weeks on the phone with Lintel, the service provider. But despite their diagnostics, they could never produce a satisfactory explanation or pay for the loss. So they lost the whole game and couldn't pay for it. And this is the backup we're trying to find. Okay. Mysteriously enough, it seems that the off-site copy happened to be on-site when the catastrophic data loss occurred. Okay. It was the lead programmer's responsibility to oversee weekly maintenance of the off-site copy and, well... Keep it off site. An explanatory note from the lead programmer has been attached. And it says S. Lucan and Kilda, the lead programmer of Fortress Accident. The off site copy was on site because there was no off site anymore. Not for me, not after eight months of crunch. Interesting. I didn't have a home anymore, so I started keeping it in the basement in the ice bear refrigerator near where I went to sleep. It was perfectly safe there. The temperature conditions were optimal. Okay. It's not very convincing, is it? Her former colleagues would agree with you. Is there anything else from this lead programmer? The production schedule ends with a few random notes that seem to be added sometime later. And read? Four months later, by an unknown author. I am the only one left, and it's gotten rather damp here. A few other businesses have gone under, too. Slipstream switched to making skis, and the hairdressers just left, cursing Martinez. Nice. They're right, though. Something's seriously wrong with this place. Martinez. All of it. Excellent. Continue. Still haven't got an answer from Lintel about what happened. All I could get were the physical coordinates of the error on the East Insulindian front on that day. Since the computation happened on air, I reckoned it had to coincide with an actually existing location. Ah, uh, this is her figuring out the church then. I have compared the coordinates to a map of Revachon West. Turns out it's only 800 meters from here. The address is Saint Brune 1147. I am going there to look this thing in the eye. Okay, tear off the printout. Tiles on the cube are still smoldering, casting the framework in a soft glow. Fluorescent play and print keys shine on the keyboard. I'm going to remove the production schedule. The filament slides out of its glowing. Just in case she might want that. Right, let's go get our dice. Okay, what do you think is going on with that computer, chalkboard, and fireplace? Uh, it's the remains of Suna's radio game studio fortress accident. Yes, I got that. What I meant was, what were they trying to achieve with this damn game? Kim likes to play. What were their ambitions? Because this here looks rather advanced. He has respect and curiosity for this failed endeavor. Okay. This is way above your tiny little policeman head. I don't know. I'm not an artist, but I am an artist. I thought I, I thought I already internalized that. No, I never got the artist one. Damn. Hmm. Mm. Right. Okay, well, 
I think. He takes a step back, steepling his hands. It looks like one of those popular pen and paper role-playing games. Only these people were trying to automate it, make it work on radio computers. Ambitious? Utter madness, he thinks. <laughs> as a compliment. Yes, you would never be able to get computers to play games. Uh, how are they planning to do that? Through call-in stations. None of the players have to be physically present. Anyone in the world can participate in the game, as long as they have a two-way radio. Okay. Then there's the game master frequency that listens in on the smaller call-in stations. I think that was supposed to coordinate the stories, functioning as a master of ceremonies of sorts. Okay. Anyone ever done it? Not to my knowledge. They make automated games in Grad, Messina, Konigstein. You know, places with industry. Fair. Not in Revachol West, among the ruins. Right. But I don't think anyone has attempted to create an interisolary game before. We just don't have the technology. And this was a role-playing game. Indeed. Those Welkins are a dead giveaway. Role-playing people love that stuff. The world looks like a modified version of the We Were board game with hit death thrown in. Okay. Super cool. Someone should give them millions of real immediately. This game is too <laughs> good to be left unfinished. Conceptualization loves it. All right, conclude. Indeed. It's ambitious and untethered from reality, but... The lieutenant tilts his head, thinking. They were insane if they thought they could do this. Uh, way to cheat money out of the investors. The curse got them. The world is cold and lonely. They would keep. Uh, this would keep it company. Let's finish it. Uh, do we have any money? Let's give them money so they can finish it and make it even bigger. Uh, I don't think it was insane. Well, no, the ideas were insane. That's okay. Yes, especially in here. The lieutenant looks around the derelict room. The pipes howl and a rat crosses the floor in front of your feet. Okay, let's keep moving. Right, give me my dice. Dice, dice, dice. Dice, dice, dice. Hi, lady! Oh, it's you again. Are you looking for a die? Yes, came back to pick up my die. Very good. That will be seven real for one custom die. Yeah. One universal die for Wiro Untethered. The dice maker opens her desk drawer and hands you the die. Become the top, top supporter on Patreon. There you go. Take a look at it. It feels icy. Just holding this die in your hand sends a jolt of cold down your spine. Through the dark resin, you can make out a nugget of bone hewn from an alligator's jaw. Excellent. Okay, next time we have shivers, we can unlock that. I don't think... Yeah, I don't have any points right now. So, let's go. And quickest way out of here is probably this way. Oh. Poor animals, no rest for their bodies after death. Aw. I like that you get new thoughts as you're moving around and progressing and changing your mind on things. Also, is this a physical instrument? I can't remember. The barbell waits patiently on the floor. Right. Uh, swap that out. And we're going to put this tool on for no particular reason. It's because your stats are changing? Yeah, the I like that. The barbell waits patiently on the floor. Like 42 percent master yeah oh yeah pure skill conjuring up an inhuman amount of strength you raise the barbell up in the air your biceps tremble but you're a savage this is a children's game <laughs> Uh, as you change gear, your new stats are hitting the thresholds for the observations. Awesome. Say nothing, revel in the feeling. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> A warm wave of accomplishment washes over your head. 
as you drop the barbell to the floor. For a moment, it feels like you're strong enough to succeed at anything you've ever set your mind to. Beautiful. Hey, but you're still in the ghost house. What if someone heard this? What if they know you're here? <laughs> Good technique. The lieutenant nods with approval. It's a trap. There's no collars on the door on the barbell. You're right. The weights may fall off. Better not touch it then. Uh, actually, I don't really care about safety. No, what kind of bastard would remove the collars? It would be a violation of EPIS safety regulations if the gym was still operating, but it isn't. No one's supposed to come here anymore. Yeah, okay. Right. Let's put on my good shirt. And by good shirt, I mean the one I've been wearing the entire game. And we should be able to report back to the cryptozoologists and then head back to the church. And you. I don't like you. I love an RPG where your fashion choices change your stats. <laughs> it's actually really popular in a lot of JRPGs. Um, but it's this is the first this style game that I've seen it like that. Like Dark Souls. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Excuse me, I must put on my festive monocle before I can punch this tree. <laughs> no, my personal favorite part of this game was that I had to remove my shoes and my pants in order to jump across a short distance of railing. It was beautiful. Okay, they're back. I wonder... You see a heavy steel door with the door does not. The cobalt blues, it leads to a side door. Mm. Thought it was more common in Western RPGs, at least originally. I mean, it's the the equipment change, yes, but the the fashion idea, that I think is, at least in my experience, more common in JRPGs. I could be completely wrong. Right, hello. Uh, first off, you. Found your husband. Oh, sweetie, I don't even know how to thank you for finding my husband and helping him out. I hope we haven't been too much trouble for you. It was truly an epic long-distance trek. <laughs> uh, it was on my way while I was working the case. It's true. Here, I want to give you a small token of my gratitude. It's a tie. Mesk in origin. The pin is an antique. Quite special. Oh, thinking of OG Fallout. Oh, no, that's true. That's true. Uh, wearing po power armor in order to go through gas rooms and things like that. That's fair. The little silvery knob holding the tie together feels warm in your hand. It's in the shape of an avian skull with eight eyes. Hmm. You could ask her about this when you get the time. It's probably a cryptid, but the phasmid, of course, is more important. Right. You never told me you saw the phasmid. Oh, you don't want to hear about some old woman's ramblings. Oh, but I do. Ramblings? Nonsense. Your description of the phasmid is the most precise I've ever heard. Good night, Bornson. Thanks for tuning in. We're going to be wrapping up here shortly anyway, so you're not going to be missing out much. But darling, I didn't even get the size of it right. Measuring things is important. How did she get the size? Hmm. You were a child, my dear. Really. It's extraordinary what you were able to describe. Now go on. Tell our friend about it. He's proven his interest in the field. It's true, you know. Reflexively, the lieutenant read his, his familiar notebook. <laughs> Kim's gonna write it down. Well, it was summer. I was building a racing track out of sand on the beach near a tall stand of reeds. Quite a tall one. Many times my height, I remember. When, all of a sudden... Yeah. Uh, let's just let her tell the story. Don't, don't drill her for questions. What happened? I looked up, and one of the reeds moved. Not like a plant, but like a living thing. It stood up and looked at me. Its body unfolded like some antique toy. I've never seen anything like it. The reeds turned into a creature. 
Nice. I didn't know this can happen, so I reached my arm and touched the thing. It felt just like a stalk of reed, but it moved, swaying, towering above me. After a while, 20 seconds, a minute maybe, it left, went into the reeds. Okay. Did you follow it? I tried, but I was only a child. There was mud and high water. I couldn't see it anymore. I was just standing there, knee deep in mud, looking around me. Hmm. Where did you go? Don't go. <laughs> Inland Empire wants to hear more. Then what? I ran back home to my grandmother and asked her if reeds could walk and told her they were looking at me. <laughs> of course, she just laughed at me, but I knew what I'd seen. Okay. For years, it was a story I told at parties when I wanted to impress boys. That sort of thing. Of course, most people just took it as a strange, amusing anecdote. So did I, honestly. But then I met Morel. Oh. We were on a date. Can you imagine? She tells me a story, and it's the most detailed report of the Insulindian phasmid I've ever heard. The sounds. She told me it hissed. This would have been useful earlier, Morel. So that's how they met. This is beyond significant for them. It did, yes. Like reeds in a gust of wind. The way it moved, the color. How some of its limbs were white, like marble. It matched perfectly with what I know from other accounts. It was amazing. Okay. If it weren't for Lena, I might have given up hope years ago. It's no exaggeration to say that she restored my faith in my profession. He looks at her with admiration, forgetting a wide smile on his face. Oh, okay. The limbs are white. Not all of them. There is some white coloration reported, along with beige, where the camouflage ends. Okay. You were on a date? Our first, yes. The old woman looks at her husband tenderly. How big was it? It's hard to say how big things are when you're quite small yourself. To me, it seemed to be taller than I was then, but that's probably not the case. Brian? What if it is the case? Uh, maybe you imagined it? How could she? Who imagines this? She didn't know about the phasmid. This is the main thing here. What makes it a confirmed sighting? She had no previous knowledge of the insect. Yeah, fair enough. So she couldn't have made it up or imagined it. That's true, yes. I'm almost certain neither my mother nor my grandmother knew of it. It was only when I started telling my story as a teenager that boys would tell me, Lena. She lowers her voice, imitating a boy. You trying to tell us you saw the insul Indian phasmid out there in those reeds? Get out of here. <laughs> they just give me a cider and ruffle my hair and tell me to stop dreaming. But I saw it. Oh, Kim, what do you think? I thought it was a wonderful story, man. He closes his notes and gives her a simple smile. But I don't believe it. A child left unattended on a warm day. Children make up stories and then end up believing them. Yeah, fair enough. Well, thank you for it anyway. You're welcome, sweetie. I do appreciate the chance to relive it whenever I get one. It was just... Such an impossibly sunshiny day. So warm. Oh. And she could get up and walk right into the reeds on her own. Into the mud. Anywhere. Oh, That's all for now. Right, you. I couldn't possibly shower thanks on you as enthusiastically as my wife has, but I am grateful for your assistance, officer. Oh. He tries to play it cool, remain professorial, but inside, this man is itching for some news on those traps. So I check the traps. Good. Okay. And? And one of them was empty. Completely empty? Yep, there's nothing in the trap. No locusts, no phasmid. No locusts? No phasmid either? That's not ideal, but... He rubs his chin. 
The empty trap was the one at your campsite. Maybe this factors into it. I definitely left that one stocked. Mm. Right from the campsite? Just means the Insulindian Phasmid is even more clever than we thought. Okay. Of course, more clever. <laughs> Kim is not amused. You're dealing with a subject near and dear to their hearts. It might behoove you to tread lightly. That's fair. Yes, the Phantasmodea picked off the Locust and escaped. This is good news, though we'll have to reconsider the design of the traps. Make them more secure. Okay. Another trip to the reeds. Yep. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what it is. What a deft hunter. Uh. Let's go with that. Of course. Be sarcastic. Unless you have an alternative hypothesis you'd like to venture. Mine stands. Okay? I wasn't being sarcastic. Actually, no. Excuse me for getting emotional. This is a big deal for us. You've helped us twice now. And brought some great news too. My gratitude and the gratitude of the Societe Cryptozoologique de Ravishon is yours. Sounds fancier that way. Confirmation bias at its best. It is, that's true. Heartfelt gratitude. But does it feel like closure? What really happened? Inland Empire is amazing and I love it. Thank you, it's an honor. We should probably return to our main investigation here. This has been refreshing, but... Yeah, fair enough. Helping cryptozoologists isn't really a priority for our organization, is it? The lieutenant looks out the window, impatiently. Okay, continue. Damn, lieutenant, have you no intellectual curiosity? <laughs> Ooh! Can I adjust my interfacing? Hold on. What is my interfacing at, by the way? Uh, two with a plus one. So... There has to be something that increases uh, inter or interfacing that I'm not using. Damn it. There we go. Uh, in the Empire and Volition. Ooh, this is actually just straight up better than the horrific necktie. Replace it. Yeah. I'm hoping that I still get to hear from the horrific necktie if I'm not wearing it. I don't know if that's the case or not. Yeah, I don't think I have anything else that's going to be useful. So, okay, let's give that a shot. Hello. Lena and I were and go. discussing the design. Consider the way Score. the trap was disturbed, as though shaken. Most likely the hands of a young person. Hands small enough to fit inside the trap, too. Okay. You should ask the red-headed boy, Kuno. I think a little hooligan called Kuno may have stolen locusts. A little hooligan? But what would a child want with bags? I don't know, he's Kuno. He does weird things. Oh, my dear Morel. You've been an old man for too long. Kids love to torment insects almost as much as they love to torment old folks. I'll talk to the little gremlin and see if anything comes up. Delinquents. My favorite. Doesn't sound like it's really his favorite. I don't blame him at all. Such a dear to us. Please let us know whatever you turn up. I have a feeling we're getting so close. Okay. Well, I see you've got all the help you need. I'll see you tonight at my place. Let's play suzerainty, but no more field trips for me. Oh, bye, Gary. He hasn't been particularly forthcoming before. He may well still be hiding something. After he's left, it's too late. Ah. Really, Gary? We're getting somewhere here. I I'd love to play suzerain tea, but... Lena, I'm sorry, but you're not getting anywhere. It was some kids. I know the little mutants around here. Leave anything out in the open and they'll steal it, even if it's bugs. He looks at his tea. 
Right. I'm going to talk to you. Morel, it's been fun. Really. But I need a bath, and I have deliveries to handle. When this tea is done, I gotta run. Okay. No, no. No need to apologize, Geary. You've been more than helpful. We'll have to take a rain check on that game of Sue's rain tea today, though. We're gonna follow this through. Okay. I'm gonna go, and we're gonna talk to you. I really owe you one for getting us out of those reeds, officer. Finally got all that soot out of my hair. Name's Gary. Hi, Gary. Yellow man. I mean, officer. Yellow man. The lieutenant raises his eyebrows slightly and takes out his notebook. Wow. Yellow man. Might this be the owner of that mug you found in the trash? This is something to ask him about after a little probing first. Interesting. So, not a lover of the great outdoors. I like nature, just not this bloody coast. It's mostly drunks and degenerates that come here. Okay. This man respects authority too much to see you for what you are. Pretend thou art a sober man. I can do that. I'm neither of those things, I can assure you. I'm a by-the-books, clean-as-a-whistle, teetotaling officer. <laughs> Not even tempted to touch intoxicants. Uh, uh, drunken degenerates, that's my crew. Sadly, I think I might be a drunk or degenerate, maybe even both. Nobody's perfect. Have you never been tempted to drink? Oh, I've been tempted. But someone has to stay strong for Revacall. Okay. Uh, his gaze shifts to the floor tiles. Uh, do you know anything about the man hanged behind the whirling and rags? Oh, so that's what the RCM in Martinez is about. Great. Great to hear someone's finally taking care of that. So you do know something about it? Yeah. No, no. Nothing. He was some kind of mercenary. But everyone here knows that. I'm just glad to hear you're looking into it. That's all. Okay. Love Gary's crypto-fascist background. <laughs> yeah, seriously. He didn't kill him or anything, but there's something going on here. Uh, the Morelethan flag given way to the Rebushon sun. Yeah. I love the backgrounds that they give to all these characters, to be honest. Um... You were surprised to see my colleague. Not many Seolites here, or anywhere, Hi. other than Seol. I met no offense, truly. Do you remember how, when we met Measurehead, and I said the next races will be a really good one? <laughs> yes. Well, this is that racist. Aha! <laughs> right. Ah, yes, our lucky racist. <laughs> uh. Hey, man. All I meant was there are not many Seolites around here. I'm just stating a fact. The lieutenant is a native of Rebushul. I feel like I'm actually seeing the game world for the first time with all the little models. When I played, I was reading so much. That's fair, yeah. I don't... I look more at the text than I do what's going on with the game itself. So yeah, I can definitely see how that's the case. Ah. Uh... So, Lieutenant is a native of Rebushul. Oh, yes. Of course he is. I was just speaking about his... connections. Let's change the subject. Wow! Is this your mug? My mug? Why would you think that? What you doing, Kronos? Oh, I'm sorry. I drank all the water. I'm sorry. Uh, you said yellow man. That's not something many people around go, go around saying. Seemed like you were calling to it longingly when you cried yellow man. <laughs> uh, I can see you recognize it. It's in your eyes. Kronos, your, your, your tail is... Nah, there we go. <laughs> I may have had a similar looking mug in the past. That's all. Wow. Still seems suspicious. Did I mention the mug was found at the scene of the lynching? Okay, okay. I admit it. 
I threw the mug away in the trash container behind the hostel. I know I shouldn't have, and I am very sorry, officer. Okay. You're not going to find me, are you? Let's see. 20 real, 100 real, 250 real. I mean, we could get rich off this guy. Do you think he'd pay 100 real? Or I can get information. Hmm. Hmm. Let's get information. That seems more valuable. Whew. Thank you. You won't regret this. I won't use another man's property to dump my garbage ever again. I don't know what got into me, really. Work has been stressful lately. Damn Koiko's price dumping us out of competition. Okay. What did you do, Gary? Nothing. Nothing. Just answering some questions. I always ask, would Kim be disappointed in this action? I mean, I feel like a fine is suitable, but I mean, yeah. Uh, how did you get into the trash container? I know a guy who works with the trash collection services, CS Municipal. He gave me a master key for the trash containers of Martinez. Wow. Why would you need to get into anybody's trash? So I can use the Whirling's trash compactor to store my own stuff. Garbage disposal is expensive as hell. The damn Bohemians run it like a mob. Okay. I'm sorry, okay? I thought I could cut costs. I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have disgraced myself. Disgraced? No need for the histrionic, sir. It was, after all, just a trash container. Okay. So, uh, Gary, did you put the clothes of the murder victim, the man who was hanged around the whirling and rags, into the trash container? Officer, please. Let me explain. It's not like that. Kronos is currently laying right here with his head on the mouse, or on my hand that's on the mouse. It's adorable. He's just this close to laying on the keyboard directly. And he is the one pushing the mouse right now. Right. Do. I was only cleaning up. I live right across the yard from where he was hanged, and I saw him stripped naked. All the clothes lying around in the yard, smelling. People are animals, you know? Okay. Then what happened? Then I came out to clean up the rags, because no one else would. I put them into the whirling's trash. Along with a broken mug, admittedly. He changes his mind mid-sentence. Okay. I was coming to throw the mug away, and, well, I threw the mug there and the clothes, too. Okay. Right. It was just civic duty. The lieutenant remarks drolly. Exactly. That's exactly what it was. Civic duty. Uh, let's see. You wouldn't know anything about the victim's missing armor, would you? Armor? No. I, I mean, yes. Of Fine. course. I know he was wearing armor, but I don't know anything about it. Did you decide you're done? I promise we'll play shortly. It's okay. Oh. An infant could see he's not telling the truth, but he's too scared to admit more wrongdoing. It's okay, Kronos. You're all right. Uh, right. Let's move on from now. I hope I can help your investigation in my small way. Okay, I can... I have a plus one from a clinking sound. What clinking sound? Right, are you a cryptozoologist too? No, no. I help Morel with research sometimes, and I've learned some things along the way. But I don't usually go in for picnics like this on my own. Okay. After all this time with Morel, he must have an opinion on cryptids. This could lead to a good one. Right. Do you have a favorite? Oh, yes. The Burning Rhino. Morel doubts he's real, but I don't much care. Because I won't be the one looking for him out in Sopper Serai. Okay. What's a Burning Rhino? A rhinoceros that looks ordinary during the day but burns brightly by night. Well, at least the males do. 
How? They have special ducts just above their shoulder blades that secrete a combustible fluid. When the rhino is just beginning to light itself, it looks as though it has wings of fire. Uh, of course it does. But how is this combustible fluid lit? And how is it lit? The rhino starts running very fast to build heat, then stops, raises its head, and sparks fly from its neck, setting its back ablaze. Okay. I want to be just like that rhino, running through the night with guns blazing. It's terrifying. Right, that seems unlikely. Yeah, well, Revacol used to be a flaming rhino once, a long time ago. That seems unlikely too, doesn't it? I mean, no. Have you seen the place? Super solid argument, Gary. Can't argue with that. Uh, why only the males? The flames are not just for decoration. They are an integral part of the beast's mating behavior. How so? During the burning rhino's mating season, herds of male rhinos, all aflame, encircle herds of female rhinos, forming a fiery ring as they begin to copulate loudly. Gary is getting a little bit too into this. Local peasants call it the passion ring. They fear the rhinos, as perhaps they should. Anyway. The lieutenant sighs without looking up from his notes. <laughs> Poor Kim. It's clear the burning rhino is dear to him on many levels. Some even spiritual. Okay, so... Why is he shifting around like that? Analyze Gary's composure. Right. Can I do anything to actually get that up? So I've got a plus one. Should really organize these in some kind of way. Uh... Hydrate, not water. Thank you, Dalton. Nom, 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 nom. Well, I've already got a plus one. So, kind of looks like that's going to have to do. All right. Very generous of, I mean, officers. Right. 8% chance. Fuck it. Is he? He's looking comfortable enough. Maybe it was just beads. Sounded like beads. But what kind of beads might a man like Gary be hiding beneath his clothes? Hmm. Are you currently sporting some anal beads? <laughs> it's not often that a game just comes out and says it, you know? <laughs> Gary, you cross-dressing by any chance? Are those prayer beads I keep hearing? Uh, let's go for that. I don't pray, officer. Faith in non-existent helpers is a sign of weakness. Not for proper Revacolian men such as ourselves. Hmm. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to do this because he's going to be leaving. But that's okay. Ah, now then. Was I doing something else? Was I going to call it a night? It has been five and a half hours. Hmm. Okay, find booze and drink it. Don't want to do that. Find out who Lady Driver is. Something we should really be doing. Okay. Well, I think we're probably going to call it a night there. Because... I'm tired and Kronos wants to play. He's sitting right here staring at me. And <laughs> he's just seriously like, dude, what the hell? So we'll go ahead and give that a save. And yeah. Um, thank you guys for being here. Very much appreciated. Thank you guys for all the subs and such as well. Always appreciate it. Good night, Dalton. Uh Kronos, what did you what did you break? <laughs> Don't, don't break the microphone. It's okay. It's okay. There you go. 
Um, but yeah, I will be back on Monday with some more of this. That should be fun. If you're not following the channel, please do. Helps me immensely. Kronos is chewing on something. He found a pencil. Really do have to go and play with him. Uh, <laughs> good night, Divine. Um, but yeah, we will be back on Monday for sure. And let's raid Trash. Trash is always nice people. And she's playing some horror games. That should be fun. I have been left Tojin. Thank you guys for being here. I really much, very much appreciate it. Um, we should pick this back up on Monday without any kind of delay. Not sure about doing anything this weekend. We'll see. But have a good night. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.